<laughs> All right. Here we are. We are live, finishing up on a little snack, both of us, right? That's right. Coming live from Boston area, Massachusetts, and Charlotte area, North Carolina. The Zimbusky Bros. How you doing, bro? Hey, I'm doing great. How you doing today, bro? Doing great. Doing great. So we're doing a little something different today, huh? And uh, I'm excited. So we uh, we we just got done celebrating our 10th episode last week, which was the milestone. We said, um, can we do it um, with the goal of saying we wanted to try something new, be consistent, and get a little bit better every week? That's right. And I think that we've been getting a little bit awesome every week that's right say. awesome and more awesome every week <laughs> and this is very new and so i'll uh just a quick recap bro um going into it it took about we're, we're talking about agile today the worlds of agile the worlds of hospitality your world my world worlds colliding um like we we always have right so the but really, if you think about it from an agile perspective, the time that it took me to prepare for our first episode 11 weeks ago, it's, got, it's about 95% less now. It's extremely less. And, and it's with your help. It's with the help of uh, our many guests who have been, they're all agile themselves because they, uh, they go with the flow. Um, and I, I've been extremely, um, you know, impressed with the people that we've had on the show because they just are uh, kind of going into the dark forest with us. So, yeah. So today is about agile. It's about um, the world of uh, the, the the two words when I think of agile, bro. And I'm going to let you kind of give your definition of it. The two words that you taught me and, and you you keep bringing up are accountability and transparency. I know there's more to it, um, but I keep reminding myself of that and it's in my business planning and writing and things like that. So um, I have a, a quick, we're going to go into this, like I said, something new, right? Cause we're going into this with really not much of an agenda. Yep. We're going to explore these worlds and ask questions to each other. Hopefully people will enjoy uh, listening and maybe ask some questions themselves. So the first one is what is an agile mindset? What is agile? A lot of it's, it's out there. And I can tell you from our world of uh, building and buying and operating and managing hotels, it's mostly something that we read about. And I have mentioned uh, for about probably about eight years or so, ever since you became a scrum master and an agile coach, um, probably longer than that. But the uh, I've mentioned it to people and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, scrum. I, it's something that has to do with uh, rugby, right? Yeah. I'm like, so, so tell me. Uh, what is agile? What is it yeah. to our millions of fans? Yeah, it's a great question, bro. And for, and for the millions and billions of people out there, um, everybody will give you a different answer to this. If someone says, what is agile? Um, a good answer for someone who's in the industry is it's a mindset. And then you go talk about that mindset. Um, and there's a, there's a lot to talk about. You mentioned accountability, transparency. There's an Agile manifesto out there, has a whole bunch of different values. There's Agile principles. Um, uh, there's there's a lot to it. There's a lot of things. That's why I try to simplify it, bro. So I think, number one, Agile is a mindset. What do you mean by mindset? It's a growth mindset. You're here to pay attention and you're here to grow yourself and your team, your company, et cetera. So that's like part one. You know, the transparency factors in it's like, are you being honest? Are you really looking at what you're at and how do you get better? There's a lot of a lot of ways to dive down into the rabbit hole of it. But at a surface level, it's are you paying attention? And, you know, are you focused on growth? And by paying attention, it's not only like what's going on for you now, for your team, your company, whatever. But it's like it's like, what are the opportunities for growth? Are we listening to the feedback that we're getting? Right. There's a, there's a lot to it. So another thing, just to simplify things, agile is more of an umbrella for a mindset, almost like an industry. It's a way of thinking like very growth mindset oriented um, versus fixed mindset, which is, hey, I've been doing the same job for the last 20 years. I want to keep going right doing that. So 
Um, another way that I think about it and is to, to keep it simple is there's once you start to go down and say, okay, well, all right, this is just all talk. They're talking about mindset, whatever. How do you actually do it? So the things I think about, the two themes that I look at are faster teams and happier people. Those are my two mantras that I go through, whether you're an agile coach, you're a scrum master, or you're, you're someone building <clears throat> the next greatest hotel using agile techniques. Think about faster teams and happier people. So what does that mean? Faster teams means how do you get more work done more efficiently, right? But you're also balanced thinking about happier people. How happy are your people now? Are they burnt out? Are they working too many hours? You're getting work like weekends or, you know, are you giving them a break? <clears throat> are they having fun? Right. So you want to see your speed go up with your ability to deliver value to your customer, client, whoever it is that you're doing your work for. You want to see your speed go up with your engine, like you're driving faster down the highway. Uh, but you want to see your happiness level go up with all the members, whether it's a team or yourself or an organization of 10,000 people. To be really honest with that, bro, that's it's that's the challenge. That's the challenge to do that. Like really, okay, every any anybody can say, hey, our company's making twice as much money this year. We're doing great and we're building hotels twice as fast. All right, how about your staff? How 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 happy are your staff? Did you scale up? Right? Are you are are they, are they happy? So those are those are some things to think about because you know you and I love people. We put people at the center of everything. Family health comes first, right? The people that we work with in the industry, they come first for us. And when you put people first and you help those people get faster and better at what they do and they're open to improve, now you have a formula for success. And that's where Agile really flourishes. Now, with that said, you don't need agile if you're just building something that you've already built for 50 years and you're going to keep building the same thing. If there's no change necessary, agile is great in environments of change for new industries. Like look at artificial intelligence now. People are making new apps, new, new programs, new companies are, are spinning up every minute. There's a lot of change happening there. That industry needs agile. They need some something of agile teams, agile leadership. Uh, et cetera, to survive because it's a constantly changing. The pace of change is so high. Whereas if you're building, um, I don't know, just give an example, like, like pencils, you're a, you're a pencil production factory and you've been making pencils for the last hundred years. And it's the same process that you had before. You don't need agile management leadership at all in there. That's just, okay, we're going to, we're going to manufacture them a little bit more efficiently. We're going to use some other techniques and things like that. But you don't need agile for people or for process much there. Um, so anyway, there's some generalizations there, but some some points hopefully people can take away from. I can say um, I in my mind here, and I'll pick one. But I just had about 15 different uh, ways that I can relate to all that in um, the in the hotel industry, say right. So um, the other way that you have related it to me, and I think you were describing how. 20 years ago or 20 more years ago, how software was developed. Uh, I remember you saying it was like, and it might not be right, but there's like 10 sequences or 10 sections to go step one, and then you'd get everything done, and then go you step two, and then step three. And then, and then by the time that you're done with step 10, you hopefully you're on budget and on time, and the software's done, right? So exactly. yep. you gave me a different mindset right because the uh um that's not agile right so agile is i don't know in more of the, the way that i see it is continuous loops of productivity and in that example maybe there's something that can from step nine that can very easily be thrown into step one and you just get it done yeah because you might have a person on your team that has a unique talent that can do step number nine and step number one, and they just get it done. And then, so you got happier people and faster teams, right? So yeah. the, um, the, how I relate it to the hotel industry is how I, um, I've always liked working with, uh, John Mang. He's an, uh, an architect here in, um, in Charlotte with Intech group. I'll give you a shout out, John. Um, the, uh, I love working with him and it has to do with, so he's an, a, 
an architect, right? So architect, yeah. designer, highly trained, highly educated, a lot of projects. He does all sectors of, of real estate and buildings, right? All cities, small, large. And we've worked on a lot of hotels and restaurants and event spaces and things like that together. So one example is in hotel development, building a new hotel, you look on a list and it'll tell you all the steps. Yep. And he likes working with me. And he said this the other day, it was a wonderful compliment. He said, I keep reminding him about the employee break room. It's always last on the list. It's always last. Let's just see if we can fit it there. And it's always in the basement, you know, or it's always next to like the elevator in the bottom, uh, the bottom uh, next to the, the housekeeping department and which the housekeeping department and the employee break rooms really in concept should be on the top floor with great views, right? Because that's really the people that make it all yep. live and breathe. So um, he, uh, so th that's an example of him using me on, on his team um, and bringing in the experience of the day-to-day -day operation of a hotel um, instead of just leaving it to the last. And so happier people, faster teams, right? It all goes faster with John and it's all, um, yeah, I, I relate that. And so if, if anyone's listening, I, I, I see John Cardonia. Hey, John, thanks for, for chiming in there, buddy. John has built and uh, managed uh, hotels from a, like a chief engineer, maintenance, building, um, construction perspective. And uh, so, John, if you have any comments about how you relate to this with um, in procurement or uh, purchasing or with uh, preventive maintenance, building hotels, whatever it might be, feel free to chime in there with your comments. So, yeah, man. Um, yeah. So, bro, I'll add in as well. So uh, we we all have our own perspectives from from how we got here. Right. We've been in industry for like 30 plus years or whatever, um, you know, and uh, so a lot of my um, background and experience all comes from technology and software companies and and uh, telecommunications, whatever, but a lot of tech and software. Right. And that's where Agile started. That's where a lot of this stuff was really necessary. It was exciting and it really created a lot of growth. And now most of the companies in the world that are tech and software and all this stuff are all uh, at least talking about Agile if they're not really doing it, but they're at least talking about it. But the thing that I, so that's my, that's my wheelhouse. But what I want to point out is that there's a lot of other Agile used in hospitality, in government, in education, and in all aspects of the world and industry today. And it's been, it's been rolling like that for the last 10, 15 years, 20 years, some of them. Uh, there's some been very successful uh, government projects. If you look at the, some of the original Agile Scrum books or whatever that were written about the, the birth of all this, some of the initial consulting was in, um, I think it was in the CIA or FBI, some of the yeah, initial the systems. CIA, you, the, the book that you referred over to me, it was yeah. the entire, like the entire connecting of the FBI systems, like when the internet first came out, right? Exactly. So that's my, criminal, my point yeah. is that there's a lot of other industries. You understand hospitality. I understand agile, but I don't, we have some other great questions here on the list. I'm very curious to learn like, Hey, what's, there are other people like me and you who have been just doing agile in construction of uh, commercial buildings or construction of hotels or building cars, right? Totally different things that I don't, you and I don't have, well, I don't have experience in those you, you do on the hotel side. But my point is, is the topic we're talking about today. Um, I think it'd be great to bring some experts on and stuff in the future. But in the meantime, let's go see what's out there, because I know there's white papers, there's stuff out there. So as we go through the questions, I just wanted to point out that you and I understand each other's industries well, but we don't know how they overlap highly because we haven't played in that space much. So we're, we're going to see what's out there, like uh, jump online and just search. So yeah, some let's of these just do a search and let's just see. Okay. See what's up? Because I'm curious. Yeah, I um maybe I'll copy and paste one of these questions into uh, our our friend Chat GPT and see what happens. You want to try yeah, that? Let's see. Yeah, it's a great idea, right? So that's another thing that a lot of people may or may not be aware of or been embraced yet. But Matt and I, Matt first brought up Chat GPT, AI, artificial intelligence, uh, what uh, language generated um material yeah and uh i've really embraced it it's helped me uh write it's how it helped me get more concise i use it mostly as i'll i'll, I'll pop in a, a the way that i think i will just vomit words 
um, uh, into a paragraph. And then I'll say, just please help make this more concise, you know, and like, so that's yeah. where I've been using it mostly. And, but from what I understand, it's pretty fascinating. So yeah, let's take a look. Let's see. You know. I'll copy here and I'll, uh, I'll share my screen because I, I actually have it up. So what's the question, bro? Can it be implemented? Oh, you know, I'll see. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll edit it. But it says, what's the best way for someone to tell the budget owner that they're missing something or that they're making a strategic mistake and still keep your job? <laughs> Got it. So um, did you put any context in a chat GPT about agile or hospitality or anything or just? No, I would need to. Uh, should I do that or? Um, yeah. What I what I would say is actually start with one of the. I, I would start with one of the other questions. The ones you have, like the second one you have listed there. I'll just type in anything you want. Maybe I'll. Just yeah. What, what was that second question? You had a, a good second one written down. Yeah. Um, it was something about. Uh, can it can it be implemented, for example, for buying a hotel? Can Agile be implemented for buying or building a hotel or designing one? Yeah, that's a great question. Let's ask that one, right? And then we can ask a follow-on question about the budgets and stuff. Let's start like high level. Cool. All right. Because I'm curious. Um, I'll give it a little bit of context, and I'll say, can what Agile leadership or Agile management? Can Agile management yeah. be implemented for? Yeah, can Agile, uh, yeah, say can Agile management, that's good, um, be implemented? Uh, and about when designing a hotel, because I was just talking about my friend John. Yeah, good. Let's do that. Same designing a, let's say when designing a 200 room hotel in Boston. Perfect. And say can agile management um, uh, techniques or something like that to give it a little bit more. Okay. Techniques. Because uh, I'm curious to be what will come back. All right. Yes. Wow. wow. <laughs> Chat GPT oh, is fast. Maybe I'll just do a quick agile methodologies emphasize flexibility, collaboration, and adaptability to change, which can be highly beneficial in complex projects like designing and building a hotel. Here are some ways that agile principles can be adapted. And I'll just read the first few. So cross-functional teams, iterative design, stakeholder involvement, prioritization, flexibility and requirements, regular reviews and retrospectives, Emphasis on sustainability and efficiency, use of technology, and continuous testing. Why don't you pick one and tell me which one that popped out on you? Yeah, so let's let's pick um, like the number three, stakeholder involvement. This is something that you mentioned the old way of doing like software or big projects is like you do step one and do step two and everyone takes a month. And then by the end of a year, you have your project done, ready to release to your customer or your stakeholders. So look at this one here. Right. Involve key stakeholders such as hotel management, investors and potential guests in the design process. How often does that happen, bro? It doesn't. Right. Oh, today. Yeah. But if you if you put agile on top of hospitality, that's exactly one of the biggest benefits. You're going to do that. It says gather feedback regularly and use it to adapt the design as needed. So how cool is that? Right. So so you and you and John get together, architect, and you guys have a lot of experience. OK, so you lay something out and then you start to interact with stakeholders. You start to interact with guests. Hey, we, if we build it this way, what do you think? Right. And there's and this is where I don't have experience. Like, how do you interact with them? But the point is you want to have fast feedback loops with the people whose lives you're impacting and changing when you're done with your project. Right. Like, so why yeah. do you care about a, a design of a hotel? Why do you care about design and construction of a hotel? Well, so guests can go there and they can have a good experience and it'll be good for our staff. Right. All the people who care about that, whose lives are going to be impacted when the project's done. If you involve a sample of those people along the way, then you're going to learn not only the, the skills and expertise that you and John and the rest of your 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 team have, that that's the foundation but a lot of the special sauce comes out of all the inter interaction that you'll have with the, uh, with the real stakeholders. And then by the time you're done, 
guests are like, oh, yeah, we know exactly what what this is because we've been talking with you all along the way. There's no surprises here. You like you listen to us. You built it the way. And yeah, we, we want to we're, we're excited. So there's no surprises. Right. Because you know, it's, 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 uh, it's a very uh, intentional word there. Stakeholder versus uh, shareholder. Right. Because the uh, yes. the, the way that I um, was forming the next question had to do with you know, the owner of the budget, you know, yeah. so that's a, sh a, a shareholder mindset. This is a stakeholder mindset where it's a, um, in that example might be saying, um, let's, you know, if we're designing a hotel, let's call our director of housekeeping from Chicago and see if she wants to join this meeting in designing the hotel. Let's yep. just hear what she has to say about it. Um, and she's a stakeholder, right? Yeah. She's, She's uh, expressing it. And then after she's done, they keep her in the loop. How's this? Any more thoughts? How's this? Any more thoughts? And with technology today, the another one using it, it's so simple to do that. It's yeah. so simple to reach out and grab other stakeholders. And so stakeholders in the world of hotels are, uh, you know, workers or employees, uh, managers uh, and uh, companies that employ them or employers. Yep. And then you got the, the the customers and guests, and you also have owners, yeah. Um, and you know shareholders. Shareholders yeah. are one stakeholder; they're not the exactly. shareholder, right? So, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I love that. And, and the reason you do that, bro. So here's an, and just to connect the dots on this, because it makes logical sense to you and me, but for the audience or anybody listening, the reason you do that is because you and John and your team, no matter how bright, brilliant, experienced you are you're not going to be 100% right. And you may miss something that that housekeeping uh, manager with experience in another part of the country has seen and heard and experienced in her world or his world. And by them, by you including them in the process, you're going to learn from the shared experience. It's sort of like, like crowdsourcing of ideas, but you're not just doing it once. You're continuously going there because odds are, no matter how smart, experienced, you know, you and me and the, the, the creation team are, we're not going to be, we're not going to be fully right. So we're going to mess up. We're going to make some mistakes. You want to make small mistakes early, fix them as you're building the design, as you're, as you're growing and, and doing that. And I, I can, I, I can give you a, a very, very, let me give you a quick example or an anecdote. I used to work uh, at, um, at Bose Corporation. Bose used to have a lot with the headphones and speakers. They used to have a lot of retail stores. And uh, one of the teams that I was a uh, scrum master for at the time, they were responsible for the, the, uh, the software that was in the store. In other words, if you're going to buy a speaker at the Bose store at the mall, that software would, would take the person's credit card and process it. And it would print the receipts and the order forms. All the point of sale activity was happening with this software. So this team was really smart, bright engineers building stuff and, for years before I was even involved there. They own that, they did it, they put it out to the stores, everybody's rolling or whatever. And then um, when I was there, I was working with the uh, one of the other people and I said, hey, what are we doing for stakeholder involvement to, to point to this item here? And we said, oh, we have some internal people who understand what the customers are. I said, well, who's the actual customer? And the answer to that was, well, um, it's not the internal person. And they said, well, the real customer of our team is the manager of the Bose store that's out there who has to go and show up at 5 a.m. and uh, unlock the gate and get in there and make sure it's ready for the retail customers to come in, right? And uh, I said, okay, well, can we get some of those people to come and meet with our team and see if what we're building is the stuff that they want? And they said, okay, let's do it. And it hadn't been done before. So I'll make it very quick. Long story short, we had a couple of the store managers come in and they're like, and they basically said, oh, yeah, the, the stuff you guys are building is cool. But our main issue is that this thing takes too long to reboot in the morning. I have to get to the store an extra hour early in order to open the store and just because I'm waiting for the software to turn on and warm up and get started. And then all of a sudden, the team is like, wow, we didn't know that was your pain point. We'll go make it faster so it boots faster. And then we'll go work on our other features later. So that's stakeholder involvement with fast feedback loops. Otherwise, all these smart people develop stuff that's not fully in line with what the customer really wants and needs. Huge. It's absolutely huge. 
Imagine that so, with a hotel. You got tens of millions of dollars going and people everywhere and stuff. It's the same thing, but it's just it's multiplied uh, exponentially how how off you can be in your trajectory. So, bro, if I work for a company, right, and I, uh, you know, we, and I got, let's say I'm a regional director and I got 10 hotels in my region and I want to make sure that I hire people with that mindset. Um, do you have any, I don't know, are there any, how do I identify that and not use the, the terminology from agile? You know what I mean? Like I can't yeah. say, Hey, uh, tell me, uh, rate yourself on an agile scale from one to 10. They're not going to know what that usually means, but what am I looking for when I'm, when I'm interviewing somebody to identify that? Yeah, that's a great question, bro. And, um, bottom line is it's, it's the, uh, you want the, you want not the hard skills, not only the hard skills, but the hard skills and soft skills. So uh, there are certain questions, uh, that you can ask, um, that will evoke that. And we all have different questions that we use to get there, depending on who we're talking to and so forth. But you want to get an understanding of how, um, how much is that individual open to change and looking for opportunities to change, right? That's one thing, like how open are they as an individual on, on the journey of continuous improvement uh, and growth for their career, for their life, right? That's sort of a a mindset thing that's woven in. So that's them as an individual. And then the next level of that is, and there's questions you can ask about that. The, the next level is how well do they represent change as a leader with a, with a team or an organization? How well can they be a change agent or an agent of change? Because that's that in it, nobody wants to change, right? Everybody wants to keep doing their job the way they used to. They've been trained a certain way. It's easier not to change. So number one, as a change agent, because that's what you're really asking about. How do you interview and qualify people who are going to be good change agents? So they're talented at their role, but they're also open to feedback, like we're talking about here, and doing things differently. So you have to have an open mind, growth mindset, we said. Um, so, and you want to ask questions about that. Yeah, like what is a change agent? But those are things, and, and the thing... Yeah. The, the thing is, bro, I've gotten, um, as I'm sure you with hospitality, I've gotten very uh, good in the agile space um, in communicating that and reading that quickly in an interview format. Um, I know to take it another level, we can get even better at having key questions like chat GPT, I'm sure give us a list of 10 questions to ask to identify that, right? And then you can, you can have a list of questions so you can pre- pre-ask questions and see what their answers are. But in reality, regardless of that, that's all digital. I think the right way to do it to answer your question is to get the person in the interview, have a handful of questions in your back pocket that you would use, and then talk with them. Because it's not as much about like question and answer. It's more about like, why did they answer it that way? How do they, right. how do they come to that, right? Like, are they, are they thinking with an open mind when you ask them the question? Or are they just trying to give you the answer you think they think you want to hear? You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think. Answer, but it's delivered in, improperly, so it's not the right person. No, yeah, and and plus, if they uh, if if you know we use some of these keywords, maybe uh, say yeah. you know proactivity. A lot of these are very somewhat cliche, but yeah. I would maybe form that and tell me if this makes sense. I would form that in a question if I'm looking for a change agent, uh, someone that can inspire change and good positive impact right uh, i would think that they probably would have done that before or at least tried to inspire change before so i would ask i would describe what that is yeah and say tell me about a time that you um inspired some sort of change that you wanted to see you know to, to quote mother Teresa, right the be the yeah. change that you want to see in the world so yeah I might ask them to, and if they can, if they can express details like behavioral interviewing, like I was here, I was there. This is the person's name I was dealing with. It was raining that day. I remember I had to ask for permission and then I, I did this and that. And, um, that's a good, that's, that's very helpful. And, I, if, um, you listen, and, and if you listen behind the answer, right, you and I have a lot of experience in, in industry. If you listen behind the answer, so that's what they say. And that may be a great answer. Like if chat GPT, it's all digital, it's all back and forth, all yeah. texting, right? 
but the person communicating that I am always listening. I'm listening for, are they thinking about faster teams and happier people? Are they thinking about, you know, if they want to get change to happen, like how do they get the behavior change to happen with their team in a graceful way? So the team actually came out happier, right? They didn't, it wasn't just like, let's do more work. So you're listening for the, you're listening for the, the person behind the answer. There you go. Positive attitude, track record of change. Yep. yep. Yeah. Yeah. Be behind the answer. Look under the hood. You're under saying, hood. right? Get a little bit deeper. Yeah. Get a and also, deeper. if you're if you have the benefit of being in person, I mean, uh, yeah, I am much better in person and being able to identify the the intention of somebody. If they keep on leaning back and they act like they don't care, they might not care as much. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm I'm making that overly simplified, but. Um, if they lean forward and say, you know, they might be getting excited about something that they don't know and express their curiosity. So, yeah. And you get a good read. I often That's compare cool. it. I often compare it, bro. It's like a first date. I mean, you're better off. You need to at least be on zoom best, best case in person. But if not, you have to be on zoom until you get to that first date, whether it's an interview or wh whatever it is, uh, talking about taking on a new job for constructing a hotel. You know, until you get to that first human to human contact, even if it's digital on Zoom, you don't really know. It's hard to read all this stuff because people can game the system today. Right. Yeah. And they can also do searches and like even in the re recruiting world and the hiring world of just, uh, you know, copying and pasting a resume and yeah. um, seeing what comes up and you never know what comes out. Yeah. Yeah, a friend of mine who's a who's a, uh, um, a successful uh, recruiter is um, focused on doing away with resumes. He's like, they're just they, they don't they don't they're too watered down. I mean, there's no way you can't get value from the resume, right? The company can't really know that what's there is accurate. And what does that really mean? It's just words on a page. Right. So I thought that was very radical of him to suggest. But I was like, you know, that's really smart because. What do the resumes really add to the mix? Now? Actually, uh, doing the same thing, but uh, removing job descriptions from from the uh, from the recruiting and from the uh, uh, the, the job uh, openings, right? Yeah. Because uh, and just putting a couple keywords. Um, because if I'm a general manager of a hotel and I'm moving and I live in North Carolina and I'm moving to California, I'm starting looking for jobs out in California. I know what the job description is. Yeah, I'm looking for the the, the company and the name. And then, uh, I want to hear about their culture. And so I will, um, f flip it a little bit, bro. And, uh, for that's, uh, my very comfortable, uh, graceful segue, which is, uh, so f from the employee or from the perspective or the, the, the candidate perspective, right. Mm. It's, it's really important if in that example, if, if I'm a, a worker, um, and, or, or a leader, whatever it might be in my, uh, my profession. And I am going out there looking for a promotion or another job, or maybe I'm going from working from home into the back into the, the, the workforce vice versa. And I'm just looking for another contract to be a consultant, whatever it might be. How do I, <laughs> maybe, I don't know uh, how to answer this, but how do I make sure that the company that I am about to work for. So I'm going to be in front of a recruiter or a, a, a person that I'm first interviewing with. Right. Yeah. And if I get past that first interview, I'm like, yes, but my perception of the company is with that person. Yeah. Right. And that person does not, that person is my, uh, the first impression, but then let's say I go to the second interview and I get to the, maybe I get to the actual hiring manager. Yeah. And I'm like, yes, that person's awesome. I really loved it. I love talking. If, if that's the person that I'm going to be um, uh, reporting to, I'm going to love this job. And then boom, I get the job. And then boom, I, I start working there. And maybe the person that hired me quits or somehow yep. leaves a year later. Um, the, uh, the, the, the culture that I have is with that person. And I'm really happy. Like you said, fast teams and, and, and happy teams. Yeah. Uh, what if that company, and it doesn't have to be agile, but what if that company doesn't reflect the culture of the relationships of the people that kind of brought me in there and that I was living and, and breathing? How do I find out what the culture of a company it is? Maybe that's the question. 
Yeah, it's it's a great question, bro. And I, I, I was asking that question a lot in the last many years. However, the answer I've gotten, it's um, it's it's different depending on on the company and the time. And, and actually, I'm going to it. I think it used to be a really, really good question to ask. And now I think it's more important because it's uh, uh, it's things are changing very quickly. So now I think the right the right question to ask is if I start with this company like this month, do I have a good manager? Is there a good culture in in within the group of people I'll be working with? I think that's what you have to ask because the greater culture of the company um, might yeah, be, true. might might be awful. Be, in the old days, 20, 30, 40 years ago, your question was dead on. It's the companies were, were a lot more homogeneous, right? They were like, well, the culture of the company is the culture of the team and the managers. Everybody's sort of like in this blended culture and different companies had different cultures and you can go to one that matched you and that's where it mattered. But today you could go to a company, great culture, like, oh, the great company culture, great manager, great, all this stuff. And then guess what? A month later, well, we're laying off half the people. We're changing the culture. We got new management in and now the culture is toxic. And literally, that's how crazy and how fast a lot of companies yeah. are changing now. Um, so you got to be, again, back to agile. You have to be actually an agile uh, employee or contractor. You have to always be open to change. Do the best you can and, and hope and look for long-term relationships with the people, with the managers, with the companies, right? There's still people that you know work at companies for many, many years, but you got to be open to change and you got to be ready. Like I, I talked with um, some um, uh, in, in individuals in the agile industry earlier this week and scrum masters, and they were talking about how their uh, the, their team coaches essentially. So some of the agile leaders out there doing good work, loving agile, just doing their job. Awesome. The company culture that they were in is getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And they're like, well, I can't really do the job the way I used to. I can't affect change for faster teams, happier people as much because I'm I'm being like handcuffed or whatever with all these things. So the culture's shifting. And they're like, oh wow, I don't know. Um, I don't know if I should look around or do whatever. And then my advice to them was look at the entire industry. There's always companies like today, it's faster than ever. Change is change, uh, change comes in like COVID came in, no one knew it was coming in. Some teams were agile. They were say, okay, we have to send all our workforce home now, work remote. What companies could act quickly and pivot on a dime and send laptops to all their employees? Say, okay, figure out how to work at home. We're going to support you. Here's the laptops. Here's the Wi-Fi. Here's your internet access, whatever you need. Uh, some companies were very good at that, and they flourished when COVID hit. A lot of yeah. companies weren't. They went out of business. It's the same thing as an individual, bro, in your job search. You don't know what's coming. You don't know when the next COVID's coming. You don't know when the next layoff's coming. You don't know when the next, like, the company's going to double in size. They're going to need to hire all your friends, right? You don't know what good or bad is coming. But if you're able to adapt to it and keep your eyes open to, like, wow, this industry's sort of going down and shifting and getting less less, less agile, less fun for me to work in, where I don't, I don't enjoy it as much. Again, I'm, I'm one of the happier members here. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not as happy anymore. What industry, what companies, what managers are good places for you to land? So you just have to be open to be able to shift. Yeah, probably the uh, the opposite of agile is rigid, right? Yeah, probably, yeah. Uh, and yeah. and and not changing, and and that can that can happen on a dime, that can happen overnight. And then you're and, gonna, um, and then you're, and then, you're it, it, then then you're more of like of a victim mindset, like wow. I was yeah. doing a great job and now I got laid off. There's so many people who are doing great work, super talented, and they got laid off in the last six to 12 months. And a lot of them are still out of work. It's like, wow. It, let, yeah. Let's, yeah. Bro, uh, another example to relate it to hotels is um, there's a 90% chance that you, uh, or I should say, there's a 10% chance if somebody stays in a, a hotel in the United States that at a Marriott hotel, for example, that they're going to interact with a Marriott employee. It's less than 10% chance. Okay. Wow. That's it. Um, it, it's like 0% chance if you stay at a hotel that's under like a hundred and maybe 1% chance or under a hundred and rooms, right? Smaller hotels, you know, Marriott is, uh, and their culture, just like that you, you were just saying the culture of Marriott historically 
um, along with some others, but in my opinion, they are tops in the yeah. world of workforce culture. Uh, they invented take care of your your associates, your team members, and they'll take care of the guests, and the guests will take care of the they'll they'll come back, and then the profits will take care of themselves. Yeah, I mean, they really invented that in my mind, and so um, uh, today. The just like McDonald's, just like you know, it's a it's a highly franchised, um, independent franchisees own the buildings and they hire, either manage it themselves, meaning the employees work for them, or they hire a third party management company. All these people are well intentioned, really good good human beings, but all, they all have their own culture too, right? So you might walk into a courtyard by Marriott uh, in um, in Brockton, Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, I say that only because you're in Massachusetts. <laughs> yeah. Um, the um, the and it, it could be owned by one entity. It could be managed, and the employees work for another entity. It's got the Marriott flag on there, so that's another culture. And then you have other, you know, about fifteen or twenty different vendors and service providers that are providing services and also products. And the Wi-Fi is different, so it's a um, uh, it's it's fascinating to talk about this because what you're saying is the answer to that is be your yourself, be flexible, learn to be adaptive to change, right? And yeah. you said, well, uh, pay attention, which yeah. I think is huge. And it takes time to reflect and pay attention to things. And so if you're feeling like you said, if things are coming around the corner and you start thinking like, I don't know. Something weird is going on here. People are leaving or uh, rules are changing. They're becoming more rigid Then just reflect on that and try to pay attention to that. That's what you're saying. And, and yeah. Yeah, this might be a time for me to affect positive change here within this culture, or maybe it's time for me to start, leave or try something different in my life. Exactly. Yeah. Be accountable, be accountable to yourself and, and to your team yeah. and, and to your, your guests and customers. And we're talking hey, bro, about, we just got a, we, Sorry, we just got a hello from uh, Emma Sarah McMillian. Hey, Emma hey. Sarah. Famous hello. celebrity telling us hello. Wow, I'm impressed. Love it. How love you doing, it. Emma Sarah? Thank you so much. Um, if you're still listening, uh, Emma Sarah, uh, so she's a mom of eight, bro. Um, and she was on our, our uh, episode, uh, oh, our God. previous episode, told us, I am positive that Emma Sarah has many examples of how this relates to her life too, because even during our episode, we had some audio problems and, uh, it was fixed within 15 seconds. Why? She called her, uh, her son say, Hey, uh, that's my audio guy. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and he very quickly helped out. So, so look, um, at, look at how adaptable they were to change, right? That wasn't a yeah. job interview. It was, it was a LinkedIn live event or live event across a lot of platforms. Right. And she did it in a matter of seconds because it's her, a culture. And her family are open to the growth mindset. They're paying attention. They know change is coming. Even though they were fully prepared, something happened. You've been fully prepared. I've been fully prepared. And sometimes the mics don't work. It's like, well, what do we got to do? All right. Well, we, yeah. we, we figure it out, right? You have to. And, and they, that used to be just an entrepreneur mindset. And there used to be an employee mindset that was a little more fixed. That's sort of like an old, simplified way of looking at it. But in reality, everybody needs the entrepreneur mindset today, yeah. in my opinion. You want to succeed in your corporate job as an employee, whatever. You want to have that be on the lookout for what's going on. Pay attention to the factors. Surround yourself with the people you want to work with. And embrace it, right? Like you said, and and the, the continuous feedback and ask like, hey, just what's happening right now? We, we don't know what's happening right now. And think about COVID and the pandemic. Um, you know, uh, one is overcoming adversity. And if you're going to overcome adversity uh, yourself, that's great. But if you overcome adversity with another person, uh, it reminds me that uh, that that show on uh, Discovery Channel, I think, uh, Forged in Fire. And I love that show, like making metal and making like knives and stuff like that. And I, but I keep thinking like teams, an agile mindset can, I think, be forged in fire, like going through this stuff together, and. And then coming out of it different and changed, right? Yeah, very true. I mean, look at it to make a very broad, you and I, neither you or I were in the military ever, but one of the um, uh, senior agile coaches who I've had the chance to work with, um, 
uh, is, is a veteran and his son is actually in the military now. We had the same conversation years ago. And I said, how do you how, how do you do it in the military? Right. How do you get the people to work together and trust each other and be adaptable to change like forged in fire? And it's like it's like what you're talking about, bro. In the military, they do that in basic training and, and a lot of different simulations and things they do. But in, in there, you're really forged in fire. I mean, your life's on the line when you're when you're defending your country and you're you're in situations. So it's um, every industry, including military, is my point needs to do the same thing. How do we get people to work better together and to be able to be adaptable to their environment as it's changing? I think going through that together, um, you know, one, and I, I'm going to get the percentages wrong, but uh, like SEAL training, right? And, you know, we've, we've, we've all seen the movies and TV shows and from the outside looking in, and it looks like it from the outside that they train, 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 train so that when the bottom drops out or when they have to go like you're going right now and this is your mission they're ready there is no preparation time because they've been preparing and training and learning and and forged in fire and they're already a cohesive team the challenge is as we uh experience just say in the corporate world or you know just in the business whether we're an entrepreneur or working for another company or working with another company another person um, it's challenging because you're, uh, you know, again, back to the, everything comes back to hotels with me, but you know, the, we, the people that do like, and stay in the hotel industry, we say the same thing. We say, I love it because it's different every day. And, yep. and it's absolutely true. You get to, not only it's different, you get to meet different people every day, new people every single day. And I almost get emotional thinking about it because I miss it. I miss being at the, in the field level. Every single day you get to meet somebody new and it's fascinating and so much fun. And that's what keeps us going. And then we have a team of people that we work with. Um, and so uh, when it comes to time, when, uh, uh, when you have to prepare for a hurricane coming, uh, you, you already have the team, you know what you have to do. And some hotels in that example, it's just another day. You'd be like, all right, you know what to do. Go there, you know, do, go prepare these uh, three or four things for the hurricane, it may or may not come. Go write a letter for the guests, let them know what's happening. Um, and with the military and the the SEAL training and things like that, I was uh, I, I've always been a bit uh, envious of that because I, I I love the learning and the training and the preparing, um, but it's just not really possible to 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 train and learn ninety percent of the time because that's war. I mean, I, I don't really like comparing business with with war, but. Uh, like Jocko, like Jocko's uh, podcast, you know, uh, several others that are, uh, have been in the military and, and uh, SEALs and things like that. And it's just fascinating, bro. And I think that there's so much that we can learn in just business um, from that kind of mindset. And I think they, like you said, it started um, uh, with the something in the government regarding uh, the FBI and trying to uh, make yeah. things run faster with better with better people. Let me ask you, is, um, uh, is there like a, is there a godfather of Agile? <laughs> There's a, a number of individuals, uh, actually two in the Boston area are the most, uh, known, uh, Jeff Sutherland and, um, yeah. uh, uh, now I'm blanking on his last name. Um, and his, uh, one of his, one of his cohorts at the time, um, uh, Ken, and now I can't. I forget it. I apologize, Ken, for forgetting it. I've met both um, individuals. Uh, they're both fantastic. If you look up Jeff and Ken and Agile Scrum, you'll see Ken. I'm gonna, uh, I, right Robinson, now. I, I, I got you covered, bro. Um, I want to say Robinson, but that's that's a, a different person. <laughs> Just so other one. Ken Schwaber. Thank you. All right. There we go. So we got you covered, bro. You don't have to apologize. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, Google. Uh, and we even go to his Wikipedia page here. Hey, Ken Schwaber. Yeah. Ken's great individual. So me being in the Boston area, I've been lucky and blessed. Both these individuals uh, are Boston based. So in the Northeast of the United States, there is a uh, large amount of education, support, et cetera, for everything that I do in, in the world of Agile. And, and um, so Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland um, were part of a team of people who basically a bunch of professionals like me and you, bro, that got together 20 something years ago. And they said, hey, the industry needs to be needs help 
you know, people aren't paying attention to customers. How do we make this better? And they brainstorm for days, bro. They brainstorm for days. Then they came up with the original um, Agile Manifesto and they all signed it. It was out in Snowbird, Utah, which I think you'll probably see in the in the thing up there somewhere in the sure. Wikipedia. But they were basically a bunch of leaders like me and you in industry. They said industry is due for some change. How do we make it better? How do we better support the people? You know, our existing processes and systems and the way we're managing um, work right now is not great. How do we make it better? You know, we're again, we're open to change. We we can we can reboot this system and make things better. And they brainstormed for days. They ended up creating the Agile Manifesto, which you can go to agilemanifesto.org. You can see the principles and you can see things. And it started out just for software development. And then it became there you go. And then it became um, uh, generalized to go across any industry. Um, so they came up with that and that was it. So short answer to your question, I would say Jeff Sutherland and Ken Schwaber are the right. godfathers of, uh, of Agile and uh, Scrum. And I'm blending. Oh, yeah, with- are you, uh, you, you, you sent me a book called Scrum. I think it was, and it was uh, by Jeff Sutherland. I, I did yeah, the, the original book there. I, I, uh, Man, I related to it the entire thing, and I've read it a couple times now, and it's got great visuals in it. So I would suggest it to anybody um, that's creating anything. I would say, um, yeah, it's uh, called the art of doing twice the work in half the time. Yes, yes, and And there's also a great YouTube video that I saw Jeff. uh, Fantastic, right? Yeah, his TED Talk, I think, right, that he did years ago. TED Talk, yeah. Because Jeff about how he realigned the entire like uh, Air Force, uh, yeah. something like the, yeah. He was a fighter pilot in 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 that's the war. right, yeah. So he he um, a, that's where a lot of this came from, you know. So I would say Jeff is a big piece of the inspiration. I wasn't there when they did that, but um, for me personally, I look to Jeff and the way that he originated and created a lot of this stuff. Um, then I think as he started to partner with Ken and other people, they really really synergized really well together. I mean, Ken and Jeff are brilliant individuals. They've been around and they've really, they've carried this torch. Um, you know, in the early days, it was just like, hey, let's try this. Let's try to do something better. Let's go try this. And there's experimenting everywhere, doing things in a new way before Agile was even a term. Uh, another word that you've used a lot, you, you've, you've used a lot with me, experimenting and speed. Yeah. Right. And, 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 learning from you uh that maybe i made this up myself but speed cannot happen if you don't experiment yeah that's a good that's a that's a great way i hadn't really thought about that bro but you're right if you you think about it right is testing and practicing and uh i relate it in the uh the world of um you know being a leader of a team right and i had to uh uh, very early, I was first promoted into management. When I was 20. Right. And so I had to like present in front of like teams of people and yeah. start training them and things like that. Uh, I was extremely slow because, you know, it's a little while ago, but I had, you know, a lot of papers, a lot of, yeah, I would be reading from it and, and things like that. And so the, um, and then uh, you, you and I have both been through uh, Toastmasters, yep. right? So the uh, <laughs> shout out to Toastmasters, who I love. And the, if anyone Ooh. from Sh- Toastmasters watches me, and they would count my ums and ahs, and they would say, you're kicked out for life. You can never come back. <laughs> I still have not figured that out. So I apologize to all of our millions of listeners for all my ums and ahs. But anyways, I'm, I'll keep on trying to limit that. Anyway, so... The, the idea of Toastmasters, I also joined uh, at a young age. There was like 20 or 30 people in the Orlando chapter back, uh, back in the day. And it was, I didn't realize it, but it was all about practicing. It was all about getting out there. And man, I can't remember what they called it, but uh, you'd be called up and it would, you just have to stand there in front of everybody, and then they would give you a topic to talk. Yeah, about. it was uh, table topics. I think they call it. Th- there you go, table topics. Yeah. yeah, and they, you know, I, I was, I had some friends in uh, Orlando, and they, they, I remember one of the questions they asked me was like, "Have you ever had to? Uh, when was the last time you had to have a difficult conversation with one of your good friends?" Oof. And I was like, "Whoa." 
<laughs> and then they, uh, through the process, they taught me to take a moment to really think about things. And, but I was stumbling and fumbling and, you know, trying to find my way through. And I still am in many ways in, in business and relationships and stuff, but it is all about practicing. And, uh, and so you talk a lot about speed and then I saw something on here and it says sprint. Yeah. So I think that's scrum and yeah. scrum is agile. Let, let me just ask you real quick. And I know that you've got to go in a few minutes and then we'll end up, but what is there a difference between scrum and agile? Yeah, it's a good, I'm glad I was going to mention this earlier, but yeah. So agile is more of a mindset. Think of it as an umbrella that goes over a lot of things. And then there's a lot of other uh, frameworks that are inside that, like lean, L-E-A-N, is a way to like eliminate waste in an organization. That started out with production, like producing cars or anything. You know, when you produce things, you wanna, you wanna lean out the waste in the production because then it helps the production go faster. Um, so lean is under the agile umbrella now. It's sort of, is on the same level, but it is sort of under the way people talk about it today. Scrum and Kanban, and like extreme programming, there's all these other different frameworks that are in there uh, that are under the agile umbrella. So agile is just more of a mindset, it's a way of thinking. Whereas scrum is a framework that you can use to help experiment with being more adaptable to change. So it gives you a little bit more like they, uh, Jeff Sutherland and Ken Schwaber right. and a number of other people created what's called the scrum guide when, when, when they created scrum. And they're more of the founders of Scrum more than Agile, I think. It just, but Agile sort of got uh, looped together with it. So Scrum's a framework that allows you to start to practice Agile. It's the most popular framework used in the world today. I think it's over 70% of teams are using Scrum. And Scrum is basically, we talked about going fast. We talked about getting fast feedback from stakeholders. Instead of doing something over a year, the typical Scrum team today spends two weeks how can we build something? And this is why on a future one, we can look into, I don't know how this works with construction, building a hotel, designing, building a hotel, but instead of taking a month to do design and then a month to start to lay the foundation, then another month to do this first floor or whatever, you know, how do you do that with agile and with scrum? Like how can you deliver value in two weeks and or a week or three weeks or whatever? How can you deal, deliver value quickly? And that's what a sprint is. A sprint is okay. We have two weeks to do a sprint. We're going to do, we're going to have a sprint goal. We're going to create the design for the, for the hotel construction. And we're going to, we're going to be uh, working with housekeepers on it to make sure it's tied in. And MVP is minimum viable product. Thank you, Karen, for putting that in there. That's, um, there's a great book, which I'm going to show here. Thanks, Karen. For, for, thank you very much, Karen, for anybody. And um, for anybody who wants to, learn more about this eric if i can show his name eric reese r-i-e-s the lean startup fantastic book it was written um i think 2011 or 2012 somewhere in there uh but this this really helped launch the entire industry for for agile for scrum even though agile and scrum is not really talked about in this book this book talks a lot about the mindset and the big thing in this book bro to summarize it in like a sentence experiment and learn from your experiments wow. as fast as you can. Like you said, speed is more experimentation. Imagine if you could experiment once a week instead of once a year and learn from that experiment based on the feedback from the market. That's what that book's kind of what we've been doing, right? We, that's what we, this is kind of an experiment of what we're doing with this and we're you know, trying it. something new and trying to learn every time. Yeah. So I'm going to, I, uh, I got chat GP, GPT up here. I got one more question to ask, uh, chat gpt uh -oh. yeah let's see what they know um is probably going to contradict everything i just said <laughs> is matt zimbrowski the best brother the best bro brother in the history of the <laughs> earth and in the beginning it says i smat so you might want to change your first one it might uh it might get my uh, alter ego smat there we go <laughs> <laughs> I'm Let's see what Chat planet. GPT has to say. Of the Earth planet. As an AI language model, I don't have access to real time data. The concept of best brother is a matter of personal opinion. <laughs> the relationships we have with Singer are special and personal. All right, bro. Well, we matter go. of personal opinion. Yes. So I think that you, you have one vote. You are the best brother in the history of the world and planet. 
All right. Yeah. Thank you, bro. That's awesome. Today's, <laughs> today's session was great. Yeah. Uh, absolutely wonderful to talk about all this. And I want to learn more about hospitality and how it relates into Agile, what people are doing out there. You know, I got a couple projects going on right now that I'm very excited about. And I'm uh, going to be, uh, I've already started to take notes on, you know, uh, and learning from this experience and also learning from this and trying to relate it. And I'm asking questions and paying attention to it yeah. right? because I, uh, and that way I can share these, uh, uh, the framework and the umbrella and agile mindset, because, um, I know, a, a, sent an email today with 35 people on it. Right. And I, I would describe them all having this mindset and mm -hmm. it is something that, uh, connects us. And it's, it's not coincidence that the people that you attract in your life have a similar type of mindset. And, right. um, it's not the brick walls of, uh, of rigidity. So nope. <laughs> cool, bro. All right, man. Well, uh, we're done. Great. We'll do it again next week. Or maybe, you know what we got to do recording. Cause, uh, oh, I'm yeah. coming up there to see you next week. That's I'm right. Be up, uh, up in uh, the Boston area. So I will be on a plane at the, the, uh, Thursday. So maybe we'll do a recording and we will, uh, publish we'll, it live. Publish so it live. Yeah. In full transparency, if you're watching this at three o'clock on next Thursday, it's going to say live, but it's really not. And so it's <laughs> recorded live in the studio audience. So, all right, bro. Love you very much. And we will uh, do this again very soon. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thank you, Emma Sarah. Thank you, John. Uh, Emma Sarah McMillian. Thank you, John Cardonia. Thank you, Karen Hasu. Um, you guys are just awesome for uh, your engagement. And thank you so much for making this special. Thank you. Love you, bro. Good stuff. Love you, bro.